It's been made clear by me in multiple videos and streams or by many others in beautifully written essays and reminders that Kiryu Koko is one of the most important figures in the VTubing scene. It's been drilled into every EN VTuber and every EN fanbase, the woman who acted as a bridge for VTubing in Japan and the Western world, a factor as to why Holomyth was conceptualized, why certain trends and norms currently exist in the industry. She was a woman legendary for her creativity, demeanor, and personality. Then, the Hololive Taiwan incident happened. She was subjected to even more restrictions than she already had, hurting her rather than protecting her and everyone in the agency. Isolated. Despite the support she drummed up, it was all from a distance. Despite the roaring applause of the fanbase and the agency members backing her up behind the scenes, in her content throughout this time, she was all alone. Accidents and incompetency ruined her time in the company, making everything worse for her. Little by little, despite how many fans tried to assure and overwhelm her with love and support, her walls cracked until she would eventually break. Kiryu Koko would eventually graduate in an event that would shake the industry and mark an end of an era, a legendary exit for a legendary dragon. But as many people would try to believe otherwise that the Taiwan incident had little to do with her graduation, I immensely disagree now in retrospect. I think that was the start of it all. She would not have been isolated and subjected to tons upon tons of harmful restrictions if not for that war. Cover Corp wouldn't have fucked up her management that badly. She would not have experienced every single terrible thing that she experienced if not for that. All the harassment, all the rules, all the bans, the disasters that happened in her channel, the loneliness, the unfairness, everything was because of that incident. Afterwards, she incarnated, or rather, she went back to her old channel, because of course she would. She has made such a loyal audience who would not return as a content creator, especially for one her size and for one who had the passion to do so. Here, she did all types of content she wanted to make, the types of content Hololive restricted her from doing. She involved her looks, involved many people that she has always wanted to collab with. Hell, she even brought back her old artist for her newest model. Kason was an unfettered version of Kiryu Koko, one unbound by detrimental roles, taking for herself the old type of unique content that made her popular, one whose income is untouched by any agency, the VTuber who retained the respect of the audience, the notoriety in her name, and the love of her peers even as she passed. It is a fate that a lot of people don't realize is actually quite a rare one, especially here in the English side of things, but such boundless freedom this immense joy and celebration, it did not come without a price. Being an indie can be hard despite all the liberties it offers. It's nice to be able to collab with anyone, but one can sometimes feel like they don't belong anywhere. A lone captain, drifting by an infinite sea without a crew to call your own. One can have as many friends as much as they want, but without a home community, it can feel isolating. Additionally, the Taiwan incident still followed her throughout this time, and it probably will for the foreseeable future. Though during this time in 2021, the most notorious act of this was when Playism, an indie publisher, was supposed to have a live stream for the Tokyo Game Show, with Kason serving as a guest. She was promptly removed after a lot of users in Bilibili started complaining, and they made a statement that she was going to be replaced, with Playism even apologizing to Bilibili and the Chinese demographic. This was responded to by major backlash by Kason's Japanese and English fanbase, berating the publisher for this decision. But while this was a cause for concern, the point was that basically, it brought up the possibility that there might be a fear among many companies in Japan, that Kason will become NG, that she could be blacklisted by many sponsors and companies that had a significant business presence in China. Additionally, when she would join V Shoujo, there were people Clippers, and even Yanner's original artist protesting her joint in the company. There was also Niji Sanji who explicitly banned any public associations and collaborations with her. Hell, perhaps even some companies don't even need to have a presence in China to blacklist her, given how some of them are quite fickle when it comes to unsafe public figures. It was a real fear, one that Kason would herself endure. Of course, she had the support of her friends and her fanbase, but I imagine such a prospect is not an easy burden to carry, especially because at the end of the day, it was a problem that she herself would only suffer alone.
Quezon is one to push the norms of what it means to be a VTuber, to innovate, make content that is not in line with VTubing in the traditional side of things. Like this funny little idea that she came up. She is the type that seemed to have ideals that fell in line with the Western and progressive style of VTubing rather than the traditional and Japanese style. In terms of what community in the spectrum she belonged to, it felt like she was somewhere in the middle. She was always in this weird spot where she was trying to incorporate the two, make a good marriage out of it. But the people that respected Kason, the fans that followed her from her Coco days, well, I think it was fair to say that a lot of them were also half and half. Which is why fan reception of any major decision she does is also half and half. As an example, Kason mentioned that her Japanese viewers wants to keep the kayfabe, meaning that as a VTuber, she should not show much of her flesh at all and to use her VTuber avatar. It's very much a thing from the traditional side of things. Whereas in the EN side, they actually liked it when she shows her skin a lot and be a lot more open. But none of this would be more evident when Kason joined V Shoujo. For some context, during this point in time, V Shoujo had endured tremendous backlash and suffered through drama that was fresh in the minds of many people. Like the Veibei drama where she implied that Shai Lily was someone that was a lesser copy of herself due to similar voice and tics, as well as also pissing a lot of Hololive fans. But don't worry though, she and Shai Lily doesn't seem to have any bad blood now. But the biggest drama of course being the Noxtaku drama, where they ultimately came across as the one in the wrong by the onlookers and the majority of the VTubing fanbase. Kason joining V Shoujo was the natural conclusion to Kason's ideals, her place in the VTubing scene, and as a big step away from her Hololive roots. Of course, while a lot of us had our jaws to the floor and screaming that she joined, like me personally, but in retrospect, it felt like it was only natural. Kason, despite having all these liberties, despite having a manager, she needed, and perhaps wanted, a place she can call her own that didn't tie her down. A place that also shares her ideals in regards to VTubing. And to have the backing of a company without compromising her freedom or her ability to make money, at least not in the same extent that Cover Corp took from her, lord knows she's complained about that one multiple times, V Shoujo was the only company that can offer that, especially since she's already well acquainted with big people there. Not only that, but Kason could use the legal support, something that she would have very much struggled with just in case something happens to her that gets her in legal trouble or steps in the wrong shoes accidentally. Handling merchandising and reaching out to brands and sponsors were also helpful. Again, perhaps due to the difficulty with her name and logistical issues that she may have experienced prior, she asserts that this is the right decision for her. And a lot of fans agree with her. But a lot of people were skeptical and worried. Hell, a lot of them were even downright upset and vitriolic because a lot of them did not like V Shoujo, saying that they lost the respect for Coco, that she betrayed Hololive, that she cast out her legacy just like that. All for the dough, all for V Shoujo. Kason would try to soothe the worries of her fanbase by holding a stream where she would answer as many questions and concerns that she could, try to get people to calm down and support her in all of this. Most were supportive, some were skeptical, but ultimately, nobody knows Kason's situation and nobody can navigate her life better than she can. She had proven herself to be headstrong, not taking shit from anybody, yet be graceful about it. Someone that can tank situations that would have made your average Minhera mentally boom and still be reserved and composed about it. She was loyal to the peers that she considered good friends and acquaintances. We could see it with her interactions with fellow contestants with her audition for her as a role in the upcoming Yakuza games, when she would advise and coach even experienced VTubers on what and what shouldn't be, and when she sent a computer to a random indie who had her stuff broken due to an earthquake among other things. Despite all the ramblings and the complaints from her former fans who hated her joining V Shoujo, Kason still had the elements and the traits that made her legendary even back in Hololive. Her innovation, her resilience, her bluntness, her genuineness, the kindness, everything. Of course, she would sometimes break. Sometimes the weight of the pain and drama were too much for her to bear, but she would always come out of it stronger. For all intents and purposes, Kason was still like a dragon. Kason is still Kiryu Koko, perhaps even better. I held the opinion that Koko stood out in Hololive because she was the rule breaker because Hololive was restrictive. It allowed Coco to push boundaries in Hololive and forced her to be creative, to bend rules, raise the middle finger to management, and set an example for her peers that a little tomfoolery is needed to spice things up, to make things better, more fun, that people deserved more and should have more. 
And while I still have that opinion, I don't think Coco was necessarily better than Kason for it. Though circumstances made her stand out, but not necessarily better. Now, she is an unrestrictive space, with everyone else just as empowered and unrestricted as her, and some because of her. She kickstarted Vshoujo JP. Her standards and her peers' standards for VTubing, whether you knew it or not, subconsciously became Western VTubing's standards. And while she may never be able to replicate the trends and found the same communities that Coco did, who has and who can, honestly? There can only be so many trends to set and foundations to build, after all. So, Nusagi, what is the price of reincarnation, as the clickbait-esque video title states, especially for one as Kason? Especially for one who might or might not feel pressured to live up to the respect and the legend built around her name that it was all downhill from here. What is the price of reincarnation for one where the baggage of their past carries over to their next life? And the answer? Nothing. At least, nothing tangible. You only need what Kason has. Not her name, not her fame, not her money or her general community respect, but her will, her resilience, her being headstrong. Coco and Kason, one and the same, won at the game. They won at VTubing. It doesn't matter if she no longer creates trends or break the industries the same way Coco did. I would argue that she still does that in her own smaller ways, but it doesn't matter if her numbers decline, if her current content no longer aligns with the kind of content her old fanbase liked here. Because now she can do what she wants. She won at the game and now she deserves to reap the rewards. She made her money. She is forever carved in the annals of VTubing history as a legendary figure. As Kason or Coco, it doesn't matter, she will always be remembered. Many VTubers respect and admire her, and she could pass on her knowledge, her experience, her story to many others. Retire as a consultant or advisor or manager of a big agency maybe. Step off the grind and work from behind the scenes to empower and support those who seek to follow in her ideals. She can virtually do anything in this industry. And when you think about it from that perspective, would you really think that Kason's VTubing career fell off? Hey everybody, thanks for watching this video. I hope you liked it. My channel and status in this industry was kickstarted in the beginning of 2022 because of Karyo Coco and my coverage of her story. So it only makes sense that my 2023 end with the coverage of Kason's story. As for my plans in 2024, I plan to significantly slow down my content and focus on more personal projects in my life and other content and ideas in other places. I have a lot of personal projects going on in 2024 and opportunities I just can't pass up and it's going to be an eventful year for me. I, even I don't know if it's going to be a good or a bad year, honestly. Of course, I don't intend to outright abandon this channel, but it's no longer going to have the weekly uploads that I've sacrificed my social life for in maintaining this entire year. Regardless, I hope you still support me. Uh, thank you for being a core part of my 2023. All my regular watchers, everyone that engages in my videos and chats in my streams, and especially my donors and members, it truly meant a lot to me in more ways than I can possibly begin to articulate. In any case, I hope you have a good year and an even better one going forward. And yeah, that's really about it. See ya.